Welcome to my channel. And Pamela Mays, it's an honor to have you here. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. This is great. Yes. So for a start, could you tell us something about yourself? Um, about myself? Well, I am on YouTube and I teach the law of one, uh, the raw material. And I don't know, I have not had very much uh, of an, I, well, let me start from the beginning. I had my awakening very late in life. I was actually 42 when I had my awakening, which is a lot later than, than some people. And uh, I would say the beginning of my childhood and upbringing and most of my adulthood, I would have considered myself an atheist. I was not spiritual at all. I, um, I had done a lot of travel. I, I would say I've been to about 30 plus countries and everywhere I traveled, there was a different religion in every country. And I just didn't see how any of them or all of them could possibly be right. It simply depended on where in the world you were. So that was basically my, my opinion in, in spirituality before my awakening. But when I turned 42, I had just gone through a, a divorce and my awakening was extremely abrupt and I was going through things that I didn't understand. Um, I would say uh, I started doing things like I became incredibly psychic at, uh, for, for about a year. Uh, I started going out of body. I started having entities come into my house and into my room, just really just scaring the crap out of me. And I didn't know how to control it. I didn't know what was causing it. So I started seeking answers and thank goodness we had the internet because uh, if this happened to me, you know, <laughs> uh, 20 years prior, I would not have been able to get the answers that I was looking for. And I'm very grateful for, for the teachers that came before me that were able to pave this way for me. Um, I ran into a lot of Dolores Cannon's work. And when she talked about the second wave of volunteers that came to earth, I knew instantly that I was part of that second wave. You know, uh, I knew not to have children for some reason, which is what a lot of second waivers uh, do. And um, I, I knew I, I didn't have any nostalgia here. You know, everyone that I had known that's in my life and in my family and friends, you know, sometimes they have nostalgia for certain periods of history and things like that. And they can feel their soul family and things like that. And I never had that. So I instantly knew that I was not from earth type thing. Mm. And being an atheist or being someone who's not spiritual, I really couldn't really wrap my head around that at the time. And then when I came across the raw material and I started to go through the books, uh, I knew the answers to every question before they were read. And that kind of started freaking me out a little bit, the way I would get information just coming at me. And I, I, I know now that they're called downloads. Um, when you suddenly start knowing things that you shouldn't know or don't understand, uh, you understand things that you've never studied and things like that. And I describe it as, you know how everyone's just a little bit psychic? You know, you, you think of someone that you hadn't thought of in a long time and then your phone rings and it's them. Or you have a song in your head and as soon as you get in your car, that song is playing on the radio. So everyone has that little bit of psychic. Um, but that was happening to me like all day for weeks. And I started to, I, I didn't know uh, what, wh where this was coming from. So I started really looking for answers and listening to other spiritual teachers. And uh, I got recommended to go to uh, a medium, a, a medium type channeler. Like, so there's two different type of channels. The one channeler is a channeler like uh, Abraham Hicks channeling where you can walk around and talk and and channel that way and then there's channels like in the law of one where someone goes into a complete trance and uh, is really being used as an instrument 
So the first channeler that I went to was a woman in, I believe she was in Rochester, New York. And when she was kind of channeling my higher self, she started talking about, she called me a star seed and she started saying how uh, I volunteered to come to earth to teach the law of one. And that when I told my soul family and my friends that I was going to earth, they just started laughing at me. <laughs> like they thought it was crazy to go to earth. And so that was, that was interesting. And as time was going by, um, and I really deep dive into the raw material because I understood it so well. And I, and I didn't understand how I could possibly understand it so well, having never studied it and had never been spiritual before. And I was still kind of seeking some answers and I found a channeler in Northern India and I, all I gave him was my name and my birth date. And he, uh, when he was doing channeling of my higher self, um, he was, he's a very good, interesting channeler. Like when he channels, uh, his, you know, his English is very broken. You know, you know, Indian accents can be hard to understand. Uh, the vocabulary is very low. And, but when he channels, it is perfect English and a huge vocabulary. Like he, he, he even sounds um, almost American. Like he doesn't sound like he's Hindi anymore. It's almost his voice changes and his dialect changes as he channels. So I knew he, he would be able to um, channel my higher self. And he, he as well, he said, I came here as part of the, the raw collective as a wanderer to teach the law of one. And he went to a couple of my different past lives. Uh, one of my past lives was on Maldek before it was destroyed to try to teach the law of one. And it was unsuccessful as the planet got destroyed. And I have been to Earth once before uh, during the Egyptian times to help build the pyramids um, with the raw collective team that came here to teach the law of one. And this is my second time at Earth to um, kind of usher in the ascension to the fourth dimension for Earth. So when I when I heard that through the channeling, it kind of gave me a little bit more uh, confidence that because when you're going through an awakening and you're getting downloads and you're learning to uh, control what's happening around you. Um, with entities coming at you and with the downloads and with the ascension symptoms that your body goes through. Uh, it kind of gave me confidence that I wasn't insane. <laughs> and uh, it actually gave me courage to actually learn how to go out of body, uh, not by accident and not just getting lost. Because the first time I went out of body, I fell into my, my neighbor's attic and I got stuck there and I didn't know how to get out. <laughs> and these things, you know, there's no there's not a lot of places you can go to learn how to control things like that. So uh, once I kind of settled in and accepted that I came here as a wanderer um, with the Rock Collective, it kind of um, kind of gave me the green light to go ahead and start teaching uh, the things that I know. Because I've been told uh, from South, like I've been told from other people that my style of teaching um, is not actually very spiritual. I teach kind of like a, sorry. I thought I turned my phone up. Sorry, I, I apologize. Um, so <laughs> my style of teaching is more like a high school teacher. You know, I'm, I'm very much about trying to give people an understanding of the law of one and the way our universe is um, organized and constructed and where we are within it to help aid us in our own ascension like you can't as when you're teaching you can uh like kind of like the high school teacher wants to teach their ch their students to a point where they can uh create their own ascension path you just want to give them the tools that they can then take with them for their journey and that's kind of like my goal when I'm teaching the law of one. I would I want uh, to teach the fun fundamentals of, and not hold back in anything in my knowledge, right? Like a mm -hmm. high school teacher does not hold back. Sometimes, like a, a professor in university 
they kind of hold back a little bit. They don't, they want to kind of be a little bit superior to their, to their students a little bit. And I really wanted to remove that from anything, anything that I teach. Uh, and um, understanding the distortions of the infinite creator and the densities, uh, the way that they're organized and how we ascend through them and to really understand what it means to uh, live the law of one. And so that's what I'm, that's what I'm doing now as I go through this process with everybody. Yes, I find it very helpful the way you go into the different terms, you know, um, like the distortion and the rock collective, they use certain terms, catalyst, you know, they use those words over and over again. And in one video, you go into all those terms and I found that very helpful. Yes, Ra is always, when you're listening to Ra being channeled, he will always use, and I just call him he because it's easier, even though it's a collective. Right. He will always use the perfect English language vocabulary to get across what he's trying to convey because a lot of things that we talk about, there really isn't an English language term for it. You know, he will find always the best one. Like for instance, um, as we go through the third density into the fourth, Ra calls it the harvest. Yes. Now, when you hear the word harvest, you almost don't want to use that term. And like, can we use the word graduation instead? when we graduate from the third density to the fourth density. But yeah. the reason why Ra would use a word like the word harvest is because have you, have you ever harvested something from your garden? Like say you harvested a, a batch of grapes. Yes. When you bring in that batch, you don't have a pristine batch of grapes. You've got bugs and twigs and leaves and little bits of dirt. And you've got a lot of different things in that batch when you bring in a harvest. So what you do after the harvest, so like we have, we are transitioning from the third density to the fourth density and we have the harvest. Now, as we go through the fourth density, the reason why it's called the harvest because we're now starting to pick out all those bugs and twigs and leaves and that process can take a while so a lot of people want to know like well if we're in fourth density why is there so many negative things around why are there why are they still here it's like well we brought in the harvest but now we got to clean it and it could take anywhere from on our earth term years anywhere from 80 to 700 years to finish the harvest. But at the end of that harvest, we are going to have like say a pristine basket of grapes with not one bad grape in there and not one twig and one leaf. And we are refining the fourth density choice that we have made. Mm -hmm. And so as, as you listen or go through the books of the raw material, understand that every word is very purposeful for why raw uses it. And it actually is fun to deep dive into the way he talks because it always has a lot more meaning than you can, than face value, I would say. Yeah. So I read someplace, you know, that the earth is already in fourth density and then the, the children being born are already in fourth density. What about people, you know, like us? Do we get very close to, to fourth density? Is it possible to get to fourth density? Uh, yes, this actually on earth as we're transitioning to fourth density, it's a very unique period uh, because anyone who came to earth had the opportunity to graduate, to harvest into fourth density in one lifetime. And almost everybody that came into Earth at this time um, has a dual body that could, they can activate. So even though you might be in your 50s, say right now, or even 60s, and that means you were born fully immersed in the third dimensional Earth, but you can have the potentiality for dual activation into the fourth density. 
Um, and you'll notice that with a lot of people that go through awakenings, when your dual body gets activated, that's basically you in the same body in one lifetime, being able to transition from third to fourth. It's quite unique. And I'll give you some examples of, for me, things that happened to me when I transitioned to my fourth density body. One of the things was that I became, I started all of a sudden having a compulsion to do art and to draw and to paint and to work with clay. And I have never ever been a very artsy person. Like I could, I was able to draw stick men and that was it. But once I started uh, ascending into fourth dimension, my dual body got activated. So uh, most people are dominated by a right and left brain. And I was very left brain, you know, I was right handed. I was not artsy, I was more analytical part. And then when my right brain got activated, well, then that's, you know, the, um, the art, the art mastery came out of me. So those are some examples of those who um, are transitioning, you might notice things change in your transition to fourth density, if you were already born in third. And yes, the children that are here right now, they are fully activated into fourth density as the planet vibrates into this because it is kind of like a bleed, you know, like say, like just like when you're harvesting those grapes, those grapes, you can't complete your entire harvest of your field in one day. It takes a few days, it takes a few years, it could take a few decades to bring in that harvest. And everybody who's on earth right now really wanted to be here it was actually um a fight almost for so many people who wants to be here because when you're before you incarnate on on earth into this into this density and realm uh you you choose you choose your parents you choose the activities you want to be but everyone kind of wanted to wear the pin saying I was on earth during the ascension, you know, and you could, you could, you know, from infinite creators perspective is like, well, we don't have a lot of availability, you know, it was pretty crowded. You might, you know, you can be in Africa, but you're going to die of starvation at the age of five, but it didn't matter. Like I'll take it. I want to be on earth. So every, and we need absolutely everybody that came here to um, raise the vibration because one of the reasons why there's so many light workers and wanderers here is because we kind of needed to push this that last mile because we wanted earth to harvest service to others and uh, we kind of cut it a little close <laughs> i would say and we really just needed everybody um i describe it as you know we wanted to ascend to the fourth density and every person was able to just bring one balloon say like helium balloon on earth and and help us raise that ascension and everybody wanted to be part of it yes so here are some uh zima andy osmanthus well thank you for being here so any questions, you know, if you have any question, pause it and then I'll pause it. So, well, you know, I suddenly have difficulty talking because when I come on this live, I ask the Ra Collective to help me. So I kind of call them in and I can feel their energy and sometimes it makes it difficult to talk. And I can feel their energy very strongly here. And just now, I even feel very moved. Well, because you are from the Ra Collective. So tell us how about being from, being part of the Ra Collective? Um, I would say the Ra Collective has a very intimate um, relationship with Earth. Um, so the for those in your audience that don't know, the Rock Collective is from Venus. They are Venusian and they are sixth density. Now, when you're in sixth density, that and 
that means that you have decided to uh, merge back with source energy itself. Uh, six density is when you move from fifth density to six density, uh, you're moving towards love. So it, the way to describe this is if, have you ever loved a partner? If you're lucky enough to find love with a partner and you love them so much, you never want to be separate from them. You know, um, if you've ever loved someone so much for them to leave you, even to just say, go to work is painful. It's painful for you to be apart for any length of time and you just simply count the minutes until you're together again. So this is the, the movement towards love. And well, what happened was when you love something that much, it's okay that you can occupy the same body because you never want to be separate. So the Rock Collective is 6.5 million, say, entities that used to be just like you and me are here right now. We're very separate right now. We are very individualized. But once you spend about a billion years with the same soul family, it doesn't make sense for you to be separate anymore. You might as well occupy the same body. And uh, the raw collective is no longer uh, embodied in a material realm. They are thought and light. And they, this soul family that graduated and got harvested from third to fourth to fifth and now into sixth. They have made the decision now to merge back with their creator, to not be individualized, even as a collective. Uh, the Rock Collective is working towards going into the seventh density. Uh, and when you get to the seventh density, you start to abandon any individuality, even as a collective. And once you get to seventh and eighth uh, densities, you will no longer even have a name for your uh, consciousness because even having a name would be an act of being separate. And so that's where the Rock Collective is headed and is working towards. Now um, on Venus, where Raw. Uh, originally is from, it was a very harmonious planet. They did not go through what Earth is going through right now. They moved through uh, the densities as service to others very quickly to the point of uh, almost being a martyr for the creator, for the infinite intelligence of consciousness. And they, uh, they really wanted to share and guide other planets like earth that same way and that's one of the reasons why Ra came to earth eleven thousand years ago and built the pyramids the reason why Ra came here is because at that period of time uh humanity was um degressing in their evolution um they were their lives were incredibly short they were only living to about 30 35 years as an entire lifetime um, they were devolving so quickly, they were headed back into becoming hunter gatherers um, and turning to war. And Ra came to Earth to help aid them in their evolution and teach the law of one. But uh, even Ra admits they were naive in their thinking because they thought that well, the reason why humanity isn't living the law of one is because they don't know about it. So they thought they could come and teach them and they would start living the law of one, looking at each other as being part of the same creator. But instead, uh, humanity wanted to still be separate. And so they have never actually left Earth, uh, even though they're not here in physical form, because uh, they're very invested in aiding humanity in their ascension. So uh, wanderers are here from the Raw Collective, but the entire uh, overall collective has never left Earth since they came here first 11,000 years ago. Uh, yeah. So I do have a question earlier on that came to my mind. So for those people who have not awakened, what are the signs, the symptoms, the signs that 
give them some clue that they are not from here and they are actually wanderers? Um, when you start, if you think that you're a wanderer in a star seed is when you start to become very interested in things that are not mainstream here on earth. And if you're a wanderer, you will start to feel, you can, you can start to see it a little bit in people right now, um, where you start to not wanting to be separate, just like, you know, um, to live, to live the law of one and to be service to others is kind of like, you know, how, when you have children or you have a pet or you have parents and the people in your life that you love and you look at them and you feel that connection with them, right? If they're part of your family, like your kids and your, and your mom and your dad, but when you start living the law of one is when you can meet someone and see them in a different country and still have that same feeling like you can love someone else's children the same way you love your own children and not see the difference in that love. That is what it means to kind of live the law of one. So if you start to have that with um, interactions with people and you can start to and you seek answers that are not part of um, Earth's history, written history that are that are taught in schools, you can you can probably bet that you're that you're a star seed. So there's star seeds and there is wanderers. And a lot of people have um, a slight off definition of that. So a star seed is someone who is not from Earth, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're from different dimensions. You could be in mid third dimension, say uh, in, in one of the Palladian planets, and you can come here as a star seed still from the third density because you want to be here on earth during the harvest you wanted to experience and to expand your consciousness and your i am here on earth so you could be a star seed like that and there are many so the 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 thing about the wanderer is a wanderer has come from the higher densities third fourth fifth and sixth and has almost um degrade or lower themselves into the lower densities. And those are the wanderers as they wander from place to place. And it could be, the thing about the third density is, is very unique compared to all other densities. Like for instance, the first density could be anywhere from 2 billion years. And the first density is us learning how to exist, our beingness. So the universe, source consciousness, wants to expand. It wants to know itself. And the way it does that is to experience being separate from itself. So it's like source energy will fracture and go out in all directions and expand. And the more it expands and the more it experiences, the more it knows itself. So as the universe expands and as consciousness expands, it expands into first density, which is basically being minerals, rocks, water. And you can spend a billion years just developing your consciousness enough to know that you exist. And when you move out of first density and go into second, well, then you're ready to experience movement. So you start being the animals, start being the trees, you live that way for millions of years and learn how to live in packs like the wolves and have a hierarchy within the species. You know how to reproduce. You spend a long time doing that. But what happens in third density, which is us right now as humans, third density only really has one purpose, and that is to make a choice. And it's to make the choice between service to others and service to self and third density is only 75,000 years. It's the twinkle of an eye on the grand scheme of how long some of these other densities, because we're only here to make that choice. And because it's so short, it's incredibly difficult. And the thing that also makes third density very unique is that we are, we are beyond the veil, the veil of forgetting. So while we're here, we have no memory 
of source, source consciousness, our previous lives. It's very unique. And the purpose for that is because we need to experience everything third density has to offer in order to make that choice, to be service to others or service to self. Does that mean that we want to go back to source energy, to love, to go towards love? Or do we want to live the law of one of being separate? So that's the choice that we're making here. And I'm very happy to say that Earth has graduated and ascended to fourth density service to others. Not by much, but we did it. <laughs> and uh, uh, we're, we weren't exactly overachievers here, but the harvest is not as much as uh, Earth was capable of. But as we move forward, we are going to continue to refine that choice of service to others. So third density is very unique in that regard. And fourth density, again, will be several millions of years um, long before we have a harvest to fifth. So it gives you an idea of how unbelievably amazing this time is that we are in right now. And that's why everyone wanted to be on earth for this time is that unique <laughs> yes you know at the same time you know there are those of us wanderers who wonder why why we come down here you know in the first place <laughs> uh yeah i think i think a lot of us feel that way <laughs> yeah um, when we because it just because it is so difficult it has it has its risks as well there's very few um, negatively oriented uh, wanderers uh, because we are going through the ascension process and harvest. If if you came here as a wanderer from like me from the from the Rock Collective, which is a very positive service to others, uh, as a wanderer, if you come here from to the third density and say Earth didn't make it and graduated or got harvested to service to self, um, we would lose our polarity and have to repeat. It's kind of like um, going to prison or something. It doesn't mean you stay there forever, but it would be, it would be severely, um, it is a, it's a risk is all it is. Um, wow. When you become a wanderer into this realm of such a difficult density, but, and that's, again, that's why there's not a lot of negatively orientated uh, wanderers here, because if, if you're negative, you have to have almost complete totalitary negative service to self, like 95% plus. There's very few entities that actually um, harvest to the polarized negative to service to self. And the reason why there's not a lot of wanderers here that are service to self is because they will lose their polar polarity as well and they would end up being positive and you don't put that kind of work in to be service to self just to lose your polarity so there simply just isn't a lot of um negative wanderers here and yeah. that so zima robinson say yeah i can see that so many people in my community and looking out for each other and being of service to each other. Yeah, and you know, the Ra co Collective, they make that, you know, service to others. It's like the most important point. Um, yeah, a good, a good point that I like to teach um, for people to have an understanding of service to self and service to others is to first understand um, when we talk about frequency and vibration, that the opposite of love is fear. And when you understand the polarity is, that's the perfect polarity of love and fear. Now, when you first hear that, you automatically kind of want to say the opposite of love is hate. But when you look at it at, on, from a vibrational perspective, when you love something, you go towards it as fast as possible. You know, you you're, when your kids run and jump into your arms, you know, that's you, you run towards something that you love. So it's the movement towards something is the feeling of love. 
uh, hate, you can still kind of go towards something that you hate. <laughs> but fear is like a snake that's snapping at you. You are moving the fastest in the opposite direction. And that's fear. So if you look at those two vibrations of fear and love, so service to others is to move towards love. Service to self is moving backwards. It's like, it, it's, it's more of you and you're moving away. And you can kind of see this in the world. Uh, and even the negative oriented individuals that are here use that very much. They, um, they get, they use it in wars. They, they get you to fear the enemy, right? You, they, uh, to separate you from them. But they would have their army say, hate the enemy because they need their army to move towards them. Um, you can see what they have been doing in this past three years. They've been instoking fear as much as possible because it's a vibration of being separate when you fear. And they know this and they've been using it um, to the maximum because it was um, it was kind of all hands on deck in order to because they, they really were in a rush. They needed to move their timeline ahead because they knew that all the timelines were um, putting them to uh, lose the planet, to lose the planet to love. Yeah. And uh I do, I do teach, I, I do have an acute understanding. So now that you know what like love is and that love is like a movement towards something, love is the second, for the law of one, love is the second distortion. So what that means is love is the second thing that ever happened. You know, um, when you look at source consciousness at the very beginning of existence of anything, the very beginning, the first moment, what was it? You know, some people say, well, in the beginning that there, there was darkness. I'm like, that's absolutely impossible. You don't know what darkness is and how much of it was there and, and, and who created that darkness. It doesn't make sense. So the first distortion in the raw teachings is free will. And understanding what free will means um, as far as the raw collective material is, it's the I am, it's your first awareness, but it's completely blank. So um, one of the things in the, in the books and the channeling of the raw is that you cannot break free will. Now, free will is not meant to be understood in the raw collective, like, oh, like you, someone can kidnap you and, and, and take you and hold you against your will or force you to do things. Uh, that's not what we mean when we say free will. And that's not really what raw means. Free will would mean that, um, like say someone, someone cannot torture you into breaking your free will. You can torture someone and say, and get them to say that two plus two equals five. But even though you say that, you don't actually believe it. You would just simply say it. So that is your free will, is the free will that makes you your unique vibration. Because in the books, a lot of the time, the questioners are asking Ra something and he won't tell them. He's like, we will not break your free will because Ra was in a position to actually change the beliefs of someone and change their frequency of who they truly are. And Ra will not do that. They will not break that free will of what makes you you unique to yourself and the uniqueness of it. But the first thing that ever happened, say, in existence was that free will, was the I am, an awareness that there is something. And as that awareness expands, just like when we use love and fear, the motion of the kind of oscillating in and out that first vibration, because once a consciousness expanded, that coming together, going towards each other is love, the feeling of love. And when we look at all the densities and everything that gets created, we understand that consciousness, thought, the feeling of a frequency of love can create something out of nothing. And when that first feeling of love 
which was the second thing in all creation, was the feeling of love. That's when the first particle of light was created. And that was the third distortion. So first we had free will, the I am, the oh my goodness, I exist. I don't know what exists. The only thing I know is that I do exist. And as the consciousness expanded, the feeling of love was felt for the first time as they come back together from that expansion and then light was created. Now, that's why we kind of have the, the saying love and light because love creates light. The feeling of love can create. And once you create light, just like when you put light through a prism, you know, a crystal, you get the rainbow and that's the chakra system. And then you can create absolutely anything from an entire universe to a speck of dust. Everything can be created through light. And as you go through the densities of first, second, and third density, just like the root chakra, red, uh, that's why in the books they call it the red ray, the orange ray, the yellow ray, the green ray. It's yeah. ray because it's a ray of light that was created through love. And as we go through the chakra system, we then go back towards light. Um, after we leave second density and go into a whole new octave. So that's a little quick um, explanation of the raw teachings of the densities that we are moving through and what it means for love and light and what it means to go back to the light and become light again. Yeah. So here is Psyche Medium Jordan Cockburn cool topic free will is the only thing to which you have full control over yes the no one can actually break your free will the the thing that makes you your unique vibration of frequency of thought that has created you cannot be broken yeah you know the so one word in the law of one that always get me a little bit throws me off is distortion how do you uh define that word distortion the way they use it so the meaning of distortion that we use it is like when something that is when something is pristine um just like light when it's pristine and perfect when you distort it you actually start to know it better and that's why we want distortion because as things get distorted uh we can experience it more just like um we need the we need the polarities of distortion uh the same way well we can't just know what sweet is unless we know what bitter is we don't know what uh one thing is until if all we experience is love and perfectness, say, that needs to be distorted so we can understand the other side of it. Because otherwise we are not expanding and the universe can't know itself better. The universe knows itself better when it has distortion within it, right? So you, yeah. everyone wants to know, well, why is there so much evil in the world? It's like, well, how would you even know what evil was unless it existed? You wouldn't know what anything existed unless First, it got distorted. And that's why actually distortion is not something to not want. Uh, you can't just not want distortion and want everything perfect. I mean, some of the experiences that we have here in the third density, it's so intense. It's so, it's so delicious, but it's only delicious when we uh, mix it in with the salty and sweet type thing. I can see Jordan. We were talking yeah. about him before the before we went live. He's here. Yeah. Yes. Hello, Jordan. He's saying, Hi Trudy, got to go. Keep up the great work. All the best, Jordan. Yes, yeah, so this is the psychic medium, Jordan Corbin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So coming to say hi. <laughs> so now, you know, for people like me from Catholic background. There is one thing about the, the infinite creator that is very difficult for us to accept, namely that our 
like my perception of God until I get into this is that God is a personal God. And then Ra Collective, I asked him in a station with a channeler, and he told me, no, God is too immense to be a personal God. So for people like us, how do you, uh, how do you describe what infinite creator is? Well, after the three first distortions of the free will, the love and the light, there's no fourth distortion. It went infinite. Okay. And it's all from the same one consciousness that has fractured and expanded out to experience itself. So some people I don't think are ready to accept it and, it, and they don't have to. Like my mother is, is religious. She believes in God and I would never take that away from her or try to explain to her what the infinite creator is um, to be rejected. Um, the infinite creator of source energy, um, a lot of spiritual teachers have metaphors to try to explain it. It's like if, if the infinite creator is the ocean, we are each two drops in that ocean and there's not a drop of that ocean that's more important than another drop of that ocean. It's all the same. We can just experience that one drop of ocean as feeling separate as a way to know itself. You know, I look at um, source energy, if it wasn't a body, like our physical body, one body, um, one arm of that body is not important than the other arm or the other leg. It's all the same one, just experiencing being separate from that one to have an understanding and an experience. And the way, so it gives, I think people comfort uh, because we're in the third density, we're, be, we're on this side of the veil of forgetting. It gives some people comfort that there's something out there that, n that must know everything more than, more than me and some superior creator that's creating me and um, I have to abide by them for judgment. Um, but that is not what the infinite creator is. The cr infinite creator is everything experiencing itself. So when we live the law of one, we go back to not being separate anymore. So you can say we're, we're all equally the same God, just having a different experience. Yeah. So that is, you know, this very Catholic part of me, although I moved from it, but it still is there where, you know, I, I did a channeling yesterday and it just suddenly came in. And one thing I find it very hard to say, and I know it is, you know, what, what the truth is, is to say that in that context, you know, I am God because it's blasphemous, you know, come for a Catholic. And it's so amazing how much the religion can stick, you know, stick to us. So I'm at a point where I think I have to, to you know, like um, do a kind of ceremony and say, okay, I'm letting go this old perception I have of God because now I can understand and experience that this oneness, you know, that we are with this oneness and God is this oneness. Yes. Um, now, they do talk about certain religious aspects in the law of one. One of them, they did talk about Jesus uh, quite a bit. And I, even I was actually, because I grew up Catholic, even though I was probably an atheist most of my life, my parents were Catholic. And everyone always talked about Jesus and how he was the son of God, but none of it made sense to me. I'm like, and when they talked about it in the Rock Collective, now Jesus, when he was 11 or 12, he was a wanderer from late fourth density. And he did come here to teach about the infinite creator and the law of one. So 
but when when you incarnate here you still have to um learn teach and then teach learn is the same is what Ra says a lot. Learn, teach, teach, learn. So when you incarnate here, you you do have to learn what it means to be part of the infinite creator before you can teach it. You know, five-year-old Jesus did not know who he was, where he came from, and knew everything about the infinite creator. He had to learn it. But he did come here with certain attributes that would assist him. And he was able to have uh, very intense energies in his in his hands, which later in life aided him in to do healing onto people. But when he was, I think, 11 or 12, he got into a fight with like a playmate and he accidentally killed him. And this devastated Jesus, absolutely devastated him. But it was the catalyst. And catalyst, the word catalyst gets used a lot. That was the catalyst that caused Jesus to go on a pilgrimage to find out what was happening to him because he was going through his awakening. And he traveled throughout India. He learned all about uh, where he came from, how the universe works and what he was here to do. And he spent a decade doing that before he finally came back uh, to um, like the Middle East area to teach what he had learned over this past decade. But that incident of him accidentally killing someone was the catalyst and oh, everyone yeah. seems to have that just um and it, it, it's that word gets used a lot in the rock collective just yeah. like say and i use and i use the example like okay that drunk driving accident was the catalyst that caused me to quit drinking <laughs> you know so all yeah. these and sometimes um people want to know why bad things happen to them in their life um because Catalysts like that acts like a bumper car to bump you into your lane, to put you on the path of what you were here for. And let's see, there's other things in the raw material that uh, did touch on certain religious history that we have. One of them was Moses. Now Moses was, he was not a wanderer, but he was a very positively polarized individual. So when Moses and I'm and I'm drawing a lot of polarities to uh, or parallels, I should say, between now and the time of Moses, because when Moses freed his people, only half of them actually went with him. The other half didn't want to leave their enslavement, and I and I'm drawing parallels to our time now, where uh, half of the people that live in the U.S. don't want this government to fail because they get checks from this government every month. They get housing, they get taken care of by this government and they don't want it to fail, even though they're enslaved to it. But the other half, just like the half that did leave with Moses, they really didn't know how to live and worship this new God that they've been told about. And they were seeking answers from Moses and he was very compelled to give them their answers. So. And I've been to Egypt, I've been to Mount Sinai. And the thing is, when Moses did go and get those Ten Commandments, because his people wanted answers on how to live free, as free men and how to worship this God, that message got distorted heavily. Those Ten Commandments were very negative, and Moses did not know it. He kind of got infiltrated by a very negative entity and you can kind of see it because all those 10 commandments you know they're very negative they're very fearful thou shall not yes you're, you you're um they kind of mix a little bit you know you've got to be careful when you're when you're dancing with the devil they they they, they fool you um and it's it was very interesting when I learned that actually, because it totally makes sense that it was a very negative message, but that distortion led us on a path of what, I think three, 4,000 years of distortion of a God that we were made to um, fear. So as religion um, kind of works its way out, as we move into uh, the fourth density, um, I always, I always say when you're refining your, your service to others, as you try to live the law of one, I tell everybody that we're not, we're not going through this life 
from third density to fourth density. We're not going through it blind. We have an amazing onboard navigational system. And those are your emotions. And when you feel love, you're on the right path. When someone is trying to instill fear in you, that's when you need to move away from it and go back towards love. Because those feelings are, are your, you know, you have intuition, but your, your mind kind of plays tricks on you. So you want to use your emotions more than your thoughts uh, to navigate your kind of decisions and what you believe. And discernment is incredibly needed with everything. Even when you're listening to a spiritual teacher, I always tell people to use your discernment. Use your, use your navigational system of your emotions. Because sometimes when someone tells you something, even if it's coming from someone who absolutely is positive, use your discernment to um, understand where your movement needs to be, is usually the advice I give. I give as many people as I can. <laughs> yes, I, I do have that, you know. I think uh, Cardinal John Henry Newman, he, he wrote about Ascent to Truth, and we actually have that something in, in us. You know, that's why core, he will always start with, if something resonates with you, then you see. If it doesn't resonate with you, then leave it alone, because, you know, that is how we judge whether something is true for us or not. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So it's very intriguing. How do you come about all, all this knowledge? I mean, it just seems to come so natural to you. I could ask you anything on the law of one, and you know it. <laughs> uh, um, like, like I said, the first time I went through the books, um, the, the answers came to me before I read it. And it was a very, it was a, it was a very weird experience first time I went through it. I'm like, it's as if I wrote the books myself. I'm like, I shouldn't know any of this, but somehow I do. <laughs> um, and it might, it might be because I'm a wanderer and not just, like I've, I haven't met very many wanderers from the Raw Collective. I've met many wanderers and they're mostly Palladian, Octurian, and then from Sirius B. But um, I've actually never met another wanderer from the Raw Collective. So I have I nothing to compare myself to. <laughs> yeah. But I do, I do love the material though. Um, even though I've gone through the books many, many times, I can't count. I actually just absolutely love going through them. I, I guess it's my nostalgia, it kind of takes me home a little bit. So um, I just love going through them over and over again, no matter how many times I read it. And I have, I, I, I'm wondering if it is, that's the same way it is with other people that have uh, a love for other like religions. I know I've heard about people reading the Bible over and over again, and I never understood it. Like, how can you yeah. read that book? It's a big book, and you read it over and over again. But then, when I had the Raw Collective uh, books, all five of them, I just read them over and over again. So, when you astral travel, do you astral travel to where the Raw Collective is? No, I haven't done that. Um, my astro traveling is getting better. Uh, going out of body, I don't go out of body as much as I did when I first had my awakening. Um, I do have a bit of a process. So when I, I'm not much of a meditator, I have to say, but I do, but I do astro travel a lot. And my method is when it's like lucid dreaming. When you think you're having a lucid dream, I would suggest to everybody to have a thing to do to kind of wake you up in your dream when you're when you're lucid dreaming. For me, it is when you know when you're in a pool or in a, a body of water and you put your hands up above your head to give yourself a good thrust because you're getting to the surface after a dive. We kind of all I, well, I live in Phoenix, so when you're in your pool, you do that all the time when you're swimming. You know, you know how to thrust yourself up to the surface. So when I'm in a dream and I want to test out if I'm dreaming or lucid dreaming, I do that motion. And if I can start flying, well, I know I know I'm dreaming, and I've woken up in my dream, and now I can control it. For the most part, sometimes it doesn't uh, it doesn't work always that way. But then after you get used to uh, doing something like that. 
waking up in your dreams, testing it, giving yourself a little bit of a test to know you're dreaming. So I start flying and I know I'm dreaming. After that, you know, you try to concentrate on your hands, something that's very familiar with you, with you. For me, it's my hands. Other people, it could be your feet. You, you concentrate on that body part. And if you want to go out of body, well, you try to put yourself in your bedroom or wherever you, you were sleeping to find your body. Now, don't go in your body, but try to find it. And that can kind of um, bring you from the astral plane back into this plane if you want to have a, a more out of body experience and then go out of body from there and try not to get lost because that's i'm not very good at it i i still you know i don't have my cell phone with me to navigate around the city i get lost almost immediately <laughs> when, I, when i when i go out of body but um it is it is a fun thing to practice this is one of the things that i do do now and and uh, i suggest people have have fun with it um as you go through your awakening. Would you, would you make a video on that? Astral traveling? <laughs> I, yeah, I, I do look at your videos and I don't believe you have one. I always find it very, very interesting. Yeah, it's, um, I don't know if I would be an expert on telling people how to astral travel being as how I'm just kind of learning and doing it myself. <laughs> Because yeah. I, don't, I have gone through different dimensions and have had, uh, I, I've had other experiences. There have been twice. It wasn't really astral traveling, but I did go out of body to go onto um, a ship. And I had that done to me twice. Wow. Um, I don't recall the second visit. I don't remember very much, but the first visit was very, um, interesting it was i i got to see what earth looked like from a from a ship you're very close though you would think that it's like the movies where you can see earth from far away i'm like they're barely in the atmosphere they're very close to the earth all these ships that are in our atmosphere right now so yeah. i did have, i did have a nice experience and i might make a video and talk about that that you know i didn't i kept that to myself for a very long time because it, it when i was going through my awakening it sounded insane so i didn't want to tell anybody <laughs> that I was there. But um, when I was when I was on the ship, I, I, I had a thought to myself, like, what am I even doing here? Then then uh, someone I knew came up to me to say to talk to me to say hi. And I was on the ship as kind of an advisor to the people that don't go to Earth that stay on the ship. They kind of wanted to know uh, I was an advisor of how how the feeling was on the ground to regular people. What are they talking about? How are they feeling about things? Because a lot of, a lot of, uh, I get asked the question like, "How come aliens haven't landed? Why aren't they just here?" And everyone can see them, and everyone can just start interacting with them, and we can, you know. And the reason why they haven't um, appeared in our skies to absolutely everybody is because they will not break that free will. Um, not enough. We're getting there, but once the entire planet and the people on it want that to happen and are ready to accept that to happen it that's the only time that they will come in they will not break our free will in that way uh kind of like uh, and it even says this in in the raw collective books it's kind of like if you were to see an island and there was native people on this island and you were watching them from afar and watching them evolve and watch and you would start to get very protective of this island and the people on it and if you were you you didn't want to interfere you wanted to just watch and if people on this island all of a sudden started to invent the wheel you would be excited for them and you would root for them that they were progressing but what you wouldn't want is someone say, let me pick on South Korea, South Korea to just land on the island and start giving everyone a car saying, forget it, We're, you don't need to start inventing the wheel, we'll teach you everything. That would be horrible for the evolution of this island. So we are very protected. There's uh, many races because there's a, a seated investment with so many different um, entities and races out there and planets that are very protective of us and are very invested in our development so whether or not anyone wants to land here too many 
entities will not allow it. So we are under a quarantine, a yeah. quarantine made of thought. It's of love thought. So um, it's not a perfect quarantine. It has been broken many times, but there is one in place and we're, we're very protected. In yeah. That way. So a friend asked me to ask you, are they blue in color and what do they look like? <laughs> There are different races out there. There are very many, many different kinds. Um, it's very infinite. The ones, um, so the raw collective, they looked a lot like us, except their, their skin was a more golden hue to it. Ah. So, um, yeah, the, the skin was a very much golden uh, skin color. Most races are actually quite beautiful. Um, the Palladians and the Octurians, uh, some of them are blue. Some of them uh, look just like us, except they have notches going up and down their, their foreheads and uh, their noses. Uh, some of them are very tall, like very tall. <laughs> like they're 15 feet just walking around. <laughs> so there's... Um, there's just so many different types of races. Uh, there's everything from the mantids, the negative oriented races that, you know, people, they call them lizard picture people. They're the draconians. They're, you know, there's so many, so many different kinds. Uh, it actually could be a fun experience as you go through your awakening. If you feel like you're not earth, earthling and you want to know your people and know your origins um one of the ways and methods that you can go about it is to set your intention you could even write it down on a card and put it beside your bed going you want to meet your soul family you want to meet your home planet you want to have start having dreams about it and like things can come at you in that way because even your soul family will not break free will they will not oh, do that to you. That's a good idea. I, I'll do that. Yes, yeah, so you you were talking about the entities coming into your room. So that was where you saw all these different, different entities? Um, no, it uh, when you're going through an awakening and you get kind of activated in that way, it's as if uh, it's as if you are in a dark forest and all of a sudden turn on a flashlight and shine it on yourself. And when that happens, um, all the energies around you kind of start to creep in and check you out a little bit. And that's what was happening when I had different entities come into my room, because some of them were quite scary. Um, they're, they're, they are not all nice. <laughs> um, it's kind of like they are thought forms for the most part. Uh, I did put out a video, like the difference between a ghost and a spirit. So when you, for a ghost, when you die and leave this realm, you sometimes leave um, some plasm and thought forms behind, kind of like when a car speeds away, it leaves tire tracks. Well, you can see those tire tracks, but the car is gone. So however long those tire tracks can linger, depending on how fast or the conditions that was around when you exited, so that's what a ghost is. It's the leftover kind of fragmented thought form of frequency of who you were and who you are that kind of got, and that kind of gets reabsorbed in the energies. So that's a ghost. Now a spirit is say from source consciousness as it comes in to visit you. They're not a fragmented thought form. They are whole that are kind of snaking their way into this realm. And it's usually to give a message or to um, to kind of the reasons can be infinite. So that's the difference between a, um, a spirit and a ghost. And I would say the the entities that came to visit me were mostly ghosts. They were uh, fragmented thought forms, but they were able to perceive me when I had my awakening. So I've had to do some cleansing in my house and had to learn how to do that because I didn't understand it when it was first happening to me. Yes. So the downloads, how did you, just kind of curious, how did you get the downloads? Um, the downloads uh, can come, they were very strong when I first had my awakening, but I, I, I still have them um, 
when I can tune in uh, to things. A download is, the way I can describe it is, say you're working on a puzzle, a thousand piece puzzle, and you kind of have all these pieces all over the place. A download is that entire puzzle being put together instantly. So you had all the pieces, but they were disorganized and you didn't know what the real, the picture was going to be it's kind of doing a puzzle without the box. You know, you don't get a sneak peek or try to figure it out. So a download is when you get all this information put together for you in an organized way where you completely understand it and you, and all of a sudden you see, you see the picture. So just like, um, when you, if you want to download, the first thing that you would want to do is say you want to understand something. Say, like, I'll, I'll give you a, I'll give you an example. So I wanted to understand what it meant because I knew you're, all of us have a higher self and our higher self is in sixth density and we're in third density. And I wanted to understand how it is that we are going to be harvested from third density to fourth density, but our higher self is in sixth density. So doesn't that mean we've already gone through this? Like I, I wanted to understand that. And I had an idea of it and my download, <laughs> my download for that was a very, very interesting. It, it, I had the um, vision of a chewing bubble gum. So, and I, and I, and I laughed at first when I first got this download and it involved the bubble gum, just trying to get um, people to understand what it means to um, make the choice into third density. So sixth density is where separatism can begin. So when the universe wants to experience itself and expand out to know itself better, that begins in sixth density. So a brand new soul, say like you or me or anyone source consciousness will fragment at sixth density and it'll go to first density to, to learn how to be something new. And when you're in third density, you have a choice. And when I use bubble gum as the choice, when you take bubble gum and you wrap it around your finger and you pull it away, you have two choices. You can either start chomping down on that bubble gum to bring it back in, or you can kind of start twirling it on your finger. So to go back from third density to source would kind of like be like you chopping on that, that bubble gum and service to others would be it winding it around your finger. So this was a download of, um, that I'm, that I, that I, that I still get about how the densities of the universe are organized and how our higher self can reside in sixth density and us be in third. So, things like but first you would have to have an intention so if you want a download if anyone out there wants to have a download about an understanding of something first put your intention that you want to understand something you know that's why journaling is very good if you do that every day and it's going to be and as the time goes by now it can take days it could take hours it could take weeks but as all kinds of bits of information that come across your day in all different ways, whether it's videos that you watch, something you read, a conversation you have with someone, all these bits of information all at once when you have your download, it could be something that you, that happened to you 20 years ago, but you will use that and everything that has come into your experience will be put together right in front of you to understand something. Yeah. And I would say that is a download. It would be an understanding of something incredibly complex that you didn't even know you knew. And all of a sudden, you know it. Just like a puzzle all of a sudden instantly gets put together in front of you instantly. That That's how, my, the best way I can kind of describe a download. Yeah. So here is, hi, Swampy. So how much time do you have? I have about 10 more minutes. 10 more minutes. Yeah, there's one thing that I just don't understand from the law of one, even when I watch it on Aram Aki and everything. Mm -hmm. Logos, how, how do you, how do you define, how do you describe the logos that the Ra Collective use? So 
you can say logos as a creation. So the first logos was the first creation of love. The second logos, which would be a sub logos, was the light. And everything else can be anything in creation can be a logos. And the way it's used in the Rock Collective is just like our entire Milky Way is a logos. A sub logos would be our solar system is a logos. It is a creation from source energy. And we have our planet is a logos or a sub logos or a sub sub logos from the universe to the galaxy, to a solar system, to a star, to a planet. And even when you look at the planet as being a sub 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 logos, we are a sub logos of the planet just like um, our bodies, everything in our bodies actually comes from the planet. You know, it's all minerals, it's all our organic matter. We eat everything, we grow, and when we die, it completely breaks apart back into the earth. So if the earth is a creation of a logos, we are a sub logos of the earth itself. Yeah. So I would say a logos is everything that's in creation, but everything in creation can give birth to a new creation and that is what a logos and sub logos is you know you explain it so well and so easily oh. <laughs> so this is just a kind of a, a curiosity question how did you go through more than 30 countries that's a lot well um as a I didn't know it at the time, but this happens to a lot of wanderers uh, where I, I understood that I'm an empath. So empaths and wanderers can somehow scatter their light as they move around. So I had an unbelievably um, un, unfathomably will to have to travel as, to as many places as I could. And I was by myself. I was in my early 20s. And I just started going. And it's interesting, I did go to Egypt and walked around the pyramids. I was in, and I don't recommend that as a single female to travel Africa, <laughs> but uh, it's, it is interesting that I was there. I actually haven't met any other females that traveled like that by themselves. But um, as now that I know I'm part of the Rock Collective, it's interesting that I actually made it to Egypt and was able to uh, see things like that. Uh, when I look back at my awakening, you know, everyone finds um, interesting things when they look back at their path. And, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Like one of them is my, my dog, the dog that I have now. She's 14, so she's getting quite old. But she was my first dog, that dog that's my dog, that you know, it wasn't the family dog or, you know, a couple's dog. It was my dog. So I got to name her and everything. And I named her Venus, which, <laughs> and this was years before my awakening. So yeah. all kinds of things like that have happened to me. And that includes um, in my travels. I think I needed to travel the way I did so I can understand different parts of the world, different religions in the world to be able to teach the law of one because... I'll, I'll end with this because uh, one question that I do get from people, you know, is how to live the law of one. Yes. What can I do every day? What I, and they want to, they know that they want to live the law of one. They want to know how. So when you understand that we are all from that one first consciousness of free will, that first distortion that came into existence, we all derived from that doesn't matter where in the universe and what density you go in, we all come from an infinite creator that has created everything from that one first thought. So as you go through your life and to live the law of one of service to others, when you see a neighbor, you can see the creator. You can see that as an extension of yourself. When you walk into nature and you see a tree, you understand that you were once a tree in your second density lives. We all went through that. We all learned how to be all these different creations. And if we all come from the one creator, everything that you see in your life as you move through your life, 
doesn't matter if it's an animal, a piece of fruit that you eat, or uh, someone that you marry. You, when you start to look at everything that you come across in your life and you start to understand that it is the creator, it is an extension of yourself. So you're going to love them. You know, you're going to start to love even what you can see as enemies or see as a service to self entity. You still love them because we are all from one. And moving through your life that way and seeing everything as part of the creator, the same way you are, you start to not feel separate. And that's how you live the law of one. That is beautiful. It's hard to practice for us, third density being, you know, we are so, so much a uh, unique unto ourselves, so separated. Mm -hmm. But it is a beautiful, you know, lesson to learn and practice. It, you, you start practicing it and you, I can see how the raw collective almost became a martyr for it because uh, because it's an amazing feeling when you start to get into it and see everyone, you start to love everyone so much <laughs> yeah. every, every day. So you, um, you move rapidly to refine that choice to serve others. So for me, it's very easy to love nature, trees, mm -hmm. all that. For me, the problem has always been people. And I, I, I think from young, I have that alienation from people. So like enemies, how do you love your, those who do you harm or how do you do it? Um, I, I do love nature as well. Uh, as a gardener, I, I do. Um, when I had my awakening, I found out that um, my trees are very much talking to me every day. Um. Uh, uh, sometimes I go out my yard and I look at a tree and it tells me that it needs to lose a branch and a branch will fall right in front of me. And I'm like, ha, huh, wait a minute. Did I make that happen? Or did I just know that was going to happen? And one time, one time I took off, uh, I started practicing taking limbs off my tree through thought by asking the tree. It's like, you, you're really overgrown on this side. I need you to drop some branches, but it's, it's too high for me to get up there with my ladder and chainsaw. So I'll start working with the tree so it can release its, its, its branches that I'm asking it to. Yeah. And you start to, when you start to, when you start to do that, um, with second density, because, um, and the next thing I'll teach in, uh, in my teaching is how the pyramids were built because they were built through the same way when we <sighs> communicate with the other densities, Yeah. The same way, the same way I'm communicating with my trees. When I see other people that seem very negative, yes, um, you just have to remind yourself that they are source energy experiencing itself. Um, in the in the books, it did say, you know, some people love the the light, and some people find comfort in the shadows. You know, some people love going to the picnic and in the sunshine and 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 um, the tasty foods and being around others and, and loving it. And some people like strolling through a dark forest, just listening to the creatures. So it is all just source energy experiencing itself. And just remind yourself of that if you meet someone who's um, going through something negative. Yeah, Osman says, yes, very difficult to treat everyone as one. <laughs> especially in this realm but uh as you as you refine your choice to serve others um it it does get easier okay. as we go into fourth density <laughs> and after we get a nice pristine harvest so do you have a final message for for us all um first to use your navigational system of your emotions to understand um, choices that you make. And if you want to, and if you dare, if you want to understand what you're here to do or what you want to do, have that exit interview before your exit interview. 
So try to, um, try to play out, you know, your inner monologue. You know, if you, if you think about conversations that you can have with yourself, with your future self. So say you walk out of the house right now and you get hit by a truck. And if you're going to have a conversation with your higher self, what would that interview look like? What would that conversation be? And, and I'll let, let your mind go there because that might guide you into the path that you want to be on in this life. Cause that seems to be a question that a lot of people want. They want to know what they feel like they should be doing something or they're not being fulfilled or, um, they're trying to find out who they are and things like that. So having, uh, doing exercise, like, exercises like that might help you. And I, I know it helped me. Yes. Yeah. I find, yeah, I'm going to do that. I never thought of doing it that way. It could be, it could be a little scary at times and it could make you cry a little bit because you, you tend to judge yourself a little too harshly sometimes about what you've done so far in your life and that you always wanted to do more. So that puts you in, um, in a place to actually get the answers that you're seeking. Yeah, because I have done like, you know, what I do usually is on my deathbed, you know, with, with this, how I feel if this is my last day or on my deathbed. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. that's that's the same. Because we will go through that. Um, anyone who's told you has ever had a past life experience, they call it being in the way station where you do a review of your entire life because doing that review helps you opt into the next life. Yeah. About what you want to do next. But can you imagine having that entire life review and then all of a sudden you snap your fingers like, Oh no, wait, I'm still in this life. I can do things. You oh, yeah. You would love that opportunity. So try to have that experience without actually having to go through that experience. It could be a good guidance system to put you on a path that you didn't know existed, but we're searching for. Yes. I would end with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's almost one and a half hours and it's been very riveting. So thank you so much for coming onto my channel. Well, thank you for having me.